Good evening. I too want to welcome you here this evening for this extraordinary performance of past and present artists of the year. For those of you who do not know who I am, my name is Charles Hilger and I had the pleasure and the honor of being the 1989 artist of the year. I'm going to play somewhat of a passive role this evening in that uh, my studio career uh, is at maybe what one could call at rest. It may start again. Uh, at some time in the future, um, that's yet to be decided. But for the 70s and the 80s, I had a glorious, glorious time. I began my career in art in the early 70s after a life-changing tour of duty in Vietnam. After I came back from that tour, spent a couple years trying to sort things out, I decided that one thing that I did want to do for a foreseeable f period of time was to create beautiful things. And of course, for those of you who are maybe aware of uh, the art during the 70s, it was a time of process. Artists were trying to explore new medium, finding ways of getting closer to medium and materials, and it was a period of discovery. As it was for me, right here in Santa Cruz, I discovered paper, and to me it was magical. And I spent every living hour for the next 20 years thoroughly enjoying my pleasure in the muse of paper. So tonight, the, actually I'll show you four slides, one of which you see now of me in a much earlier state, <laughs> hair-wise anyway. Um, and it, I involved myself with handmade paper and tried anything and everything that I could to play with that material. It was white by its nature, coming from cotton and rag, and it had a surface and it had an edge. 
and I spent many countless hours and created a, probably over a thousand pieces involving and exploring just those elements and limiting myself to that. But by limiting it, it's kind of like going through the eye of a needle. Uh, the entire universe was open to me to play, in which I did. So the four slides that are on tonight were of works that I created during the 80s. The titles are insignificant and not important, and they'll serve to dramatize uh, the look of what I did then during that, a long period of time in the 80s. Uh, the, the, the pieces you will see will be very representative of all my work during the 80s. And I was delighted to explore, continually exploring, trying, finding new ways to present it and make a statement in art but I will have to say one overriding thing is that all the while, I truly and honestly, unabashedly pursued the elusive white muse. So now I'd like to turn the stage over to my friend and fellow artist of the year, Jim Houston, to uh, further that endeavor. Thank you very much. <laughs> Since Chuck Hilgers has chosen to feature some of his work with white paper, uh, he has asked me to read an excerpt from Moby Dick, expressing Herman Melville's opinion on the subject of whiteness. I have to tell you that I jumped at the chance to do this, uh, in part because I admire Chuck's work and in part because I also love this novel. Uh, and it is not every day that someone asks you to read out loud from Moby Dick. Uh, while it's one of the world's great adventure stories, it is also Melville's profound meditation on the shapes and mysteries of the human condition, such as we hear in these passages from the chapter called The Whiteness of the Whale. Aside from those more obvious considerations touching Moby Dick, which could not but occasionally awaken in any man's soul some alarm, there was another thought, or rather vague, nameless horror concerning him, which at times by its intensity completely overpowered all the rest. And yet so mystical and well-nigh ineffable was it that I almost despair of putting it in a comprehensible form. It was the whiteness of the whale that above all things appalled me. How can I hope to explain myself here? And yet, in some dim, random way, explain myself I must, else all these chapters might be naught. Though in many natural objects whiteness refiningly enhances beauty, as if imparting some special virtue of its own, as in marbles, japonicas, and pearls, and though various nations have in some way recognized a certain royal preeminence in this hue, even the barbaric grand old kings of Pegu, placing the title Lord of the White Elephants above all their other magniloquent ascriptions of dominion, and the modern kings of Siam unfurling the same snow-white quadruped in the royal standard. And though besides all this whiteness has been even made significant of gladness, for among the Romans a white stone marked a joyful day. And though in other mortal sympathies and symbolizings, this same hue is made the emblem of many touching noble things, the innocence of brides, the benignity of age. Though among the red men of America, the giving of the white belt of wampum was the deepest pledge of honor, Yet for all these accumulated associations with whatever is sweet and honorable and sublime, there yet lurks an elusive something in the innermost idea of this hue which strikes more of panic to the soul than that redness which affrights in blood. This elusive quality it is which causes the thought of whiteness when divorced from more kindly associations and coupled with any object terrible in itself to heighten that terror to the furthest bounds. Witness the white bear of the poles and the white shark of the tropics. What but their smooth, flaky whiteness makes them the transcendent horrors they are. It is at once the most meaning symbol of spiritual things, nay, the very veil of the Christian's deity, 
and yet it is the intensifying agent in things the most appalling to mankind. Is it that by its indefiniteness it shadows forth the heartless voids and immensities of the universe and thus stabs us from behind with the thought of annihilation when beholding the white depths of the Milky Way? Or is it that as in essence whiteness is not so much a color as the visible absence of color? and at the same time the concrete of all colors. Is it for these reasons that there is such a dumb blankness full of meaning in a wide landscape of snows, a colorless all color of atheism from which we shrink? And like willful travelers in Lapland who refuse to wear colored and coloring glasses upon their eyes, so the wretched infidel gazes himself blind at the monumental white shroud that wraps all the prospect around him. And of all these things, the albino whale was the symbol. Wonder ye then at the fiery hunt. Thank you. Chuck has been generous enough um, to invite into his section a tribute to artists of the year who could not be here tonight. Um, poet Adrian Rich, artist of the year for 1995, was unable to be here, but she told me to wish everyone a great new century. And she asked me to read the following poem, which she has dedicated to this performance. It is new, unpublished, and has never been read in public before. It is called Spaces and has an epigraph from the 17th century French scientist and thinker Blas Pascal, who wrote, quote, the eternal silence of these spaces frightens me. Meditating on this statement at the end of the century, Adrian realized the great spaces of the universe didn't frighten, but rather comforted her. They gave her a sense of relief that what goes on on this earth, as bad as it is sometimes, is not all we can know, and that there are spaces bigger than we can know, spaces that transcend us. Spaces by Adrian Rich. I love the infinity of these silent spaces dark blue shot with death rays, but only a short distance. Deep keep, of course, water and batteries, antibiotics. Always look at California for the last time. We weren't birds, were we, to flutter past each other? But what were we meant to do? standing or lying down together on the bare slope where we were driven, the most personal feelings become historical. Keep your hands knotted deep inside your sweater. The instruments of force are more credible than beauty. Inside a glass paperweight, dust swirls, man's and our. Where was the beauty anyway when we shouldered past each other? Where is it now in the hollow lounge of the grounded airline where the cameras for the desoling project are being handed out, each of us instructed to shoot the others naked? If you want to feel the true time of this universe, put your hands over mine on the stainless pelvic rudder. No, here. Sometimes the most impassive ones will shudder. The infinity of these spaces comforts me. Simple textures falling open like a sweater. William, e William Everson uh, moved to this region in 1969 
to take a position as poet in residence at UC Santa Cruz. He settled out near Swanton and soon became the spiritual father of our literary community here. He was named uh, County Artist of the Year in 1991, just three years before he passed away. I had the good fortune to know him as both friend and mentor, and it was a great and it's a great honor to read one of his poems so that his words can be part of our program here tonight. Uh, this is the title poem from his first collection, published back in 1939, while he was still farming over near Selma in the Central Valley, where he was born. Uh, I like the way it plays against uh, the furrows in Chuck's piece up here on the screen. Uh, I also think the wisdom. Uh, that Bill Everson drew from the land he worked over 60 years ago uh, can make a good New Year's reminder for us all as we contemplate where the next century might be taking us. This is San Joaquin by William Everson. This valley, after the storms, can be beautiful beyond the telling, though our city folk scorn it cursing heat in the summer and drabness in winter, and flee it, Yosemite and the sea. They seek splendor. Who would touch them must stun them. The nerve that is dying needs thunder to rouse it. I, in the vineyard, in green time and dead time, come to it dearly and take nature neither freaked nor amazing, but the secret shining, the soft, indeterminate wonder. I watch it, morning and noon, the unutterable shadows, and love as the leaf does the bow. So let's hear it for William Everson, Adrian Rich, and Chuck Hilger. Chuck, can you come back out? segment of the show, I have been inspired by the music of Lou Harrison. In fact, I've been inspired for quite some years by the music of Lou Harrison. And I've written four poems for Lou's music. And I would like to um, read the poems now. They were written especially for this occasion. The choreography and dance will be done by Lara Lee Whittle. The only thing I need to tell you before I begin is that Awalo Ki Teswara is the Buddha of compassion who has chosen to return to the earth to save souls. I am a Walo Kiteswara, saver of souls. I dance between heaven and earth on the tips of my toes, whirl and dip for you, for your soul. I am a Walo Kiteswara. To save others, I dance between here and there, then and now, between being and nothingness, living and dead. The stars like diamonds circle my head, sweeping from the darkness beyond, shawls of ice around my shoulders and neck while I jig on the blades of earthly fires. I am a wallow kiteswara, saver of souls, dancing between new year and no year, dancing for you, for you, for your soul.
in the dance of life. You got to woo the wood in the match before you light it. And the wavering shadow of the wave underneath the wave in the flame when you ignite it. You got to bet on the wager that wags the tail untold on the shaggy dog come out of the cold to warm itself by the burning logs roaring in the grate. Because from the start, You've got to be so bold as to woo the fire dancing in your heart. newest child has lost its way in the chiming forest. The woodpecker is at work and will not look up. Thunder turns its face. The chattering insects scatter from deer hooves and trudging bears. The leaves tremble and tick their tongues. What a racket! What a wrangling and jangling no one knows what to do or where to go until the warm breeze that has been searching over meadows and hills slides through the trees, scoops the child up, and carries it home.
this raindrop life. We arrive, a raindrop never at rest, wind-tossed, trembling through sunlight, somersaulting through updrafts, swept down chasms of shadow that are suddenly shimmering and wide, only to be tossed skyward again, always here and there, everywhere, never at rest. Tapping, wrapping, twined in braids of sunlight, turning this way and that, endlessly looking for our place, we fall from ledges and leaves, slapping boulders and stones, spattering tree trunks, sliding down weed stalks, only to be tugged upward and to fall again, tapping, wrapping, falling this way and that, assuming the shapes of boulders and leaves or whatever objects we encounter along the way. with its flicker of sunlight, 
and each dropping in the end to the sun-glazed puddle that expands to a pond as we sink through its depths. And then, with darkness surrounding us and pushing outward in all directions, we continue to sink into what is now the weightless weight of an endless sea. Ms. Lara Lee Whittle. There's an emphasis on new work tonight, so I'm going to read a few pages from a novel I recently completed uh, to be published later this year. It's called Snow Mountain Passage. It's a historical novel set in the 1840s, mostly here in Northern California. It's based on the experiences of a family who crossed the continent with the infamous Donner Party, a family who started out from Springfield, Illinois in 1846 uh, and actually ended up right here in Santa Cruz. I want to tell you a bit about how I got interested in this material. Uh, Ernest Hemingway used to say that um, a writer uh, does not choose his material, your, mater your material chooses you. And for many years, we've been living in a house over on East Cliff Drive, uh, an elderly Victorian about a block back from the beach that was once inhabited by the descendants of James Fraser Reed, the fellow who, from Springfield who co-organized what came to be known as the Donner Party. His grandson, Fraser Lewis, bought this house in 1915 after he made a lot of money selling a candy bar that he invented over in Capitola called the Fraser Lewis Victoria Cream, which you can still buy over there at Buckhart's Candy Store right around the corner from where we live. Uh, when he bought this house, he brought along his aging mother, Patty Reed, who was the younger daughter of James Reed and one of the younger survivors of the Donner Party. It's her little doll on display up there 
uh, at, at Sutter's Fort in Sacramento that has become one of the most popular artifacts from that era. For the last 10 years of her long life, Patty Reed lived in what is now our house and died in what is now our bedroom in 1923. Now, this novel had its origins a while back when Patty began to talk to me, or at least I began to feel her voice in the house. My wife got worried about this because she is not comfortable with the idea of spirits lingering around a piece of property. But I told her there was nothing to worry about. I told her if Patty Reed was talking to me, that's good. A novelist, you see, will take anything he can get if it helps to move the story along. Uh, about half of this book is now written in Patty's voice while she was in her 80s, sitting on what is now our front porch looking out at the beach and thinking back over her family's life and her father's life. A lot of her memories are triggered by what's right out in front of her, the various features of Monterey Bay and the Pacific Ocean beyond. So I'm going to read the prologue to Snow Mountain Passage, which is the only part of this novel that's so far been published. It came out just this month, I want to show this magazine, in a special issue of Quarry West, which is edited up at UC Santa Cruz. Uh, devoted, this issue is devoted to the poets and writers of the Monterey Bay region. Uh, as far as I know, it's the first literary journal ever published uh, that includes work from both sides uh, of our bay. Uh, further evidence of this region's abundant creative activity. So this is the prologue um, from the novel. It's titled, From the Trail Notes of Patty Reed, and there's a dateline Santa Cruz, California, October 1920. Last night, I dreamed again about my mother. She was standing in the snow. There were trees with snow-laden branches. She wore a long coat and her hair hung loose. Her arms reached toward me. She was speaking words I could not hear. I ran through the snow while her mouth spoke the silent words. I was young, a little girl, and also the age I am now. For a long time I ran toward her with outstretched arms. Finally I was close enough to hear her soft voice say, You understand that men will always leave you. I stopped running and in my mind called out to her, No, it isn't so. Her mouth twitched as if she were about to speak again. She wanted to say, listen to me, Patty. She was trying to say it. I woke up then and spoke aloud. Women leave you too. I was speaking right to her and I waited, expecting to hear her voice in my ear as if she were close by me in the dark. I whispered, don't you remember? But she was gone. I dropped back against my pillow and lay there half the night trying to fall asleep so she would come to me again and speak again. I couldn't sleep. I had started thinking about her life and Papa's life and all our lives, about who stays and who leaves who and when, thinking how a man can be right there next to you and at the same time somehow gone off by himself or maybe already gone away forever. How a mother can do that too thinking then about all of them from those years so long ago, walking in and out of my mind like people in a pageant, ordinary people who did not expect such a crowd to be watching them pass by. Papa and Mama, my brothers and sisters, the Teamsters and Mule Skinners and grizzled husbands on their dried up wagon seats and their women watching the trail ahead and the Indians who traveled with us from time to time every kind of Indian you can think of, Sauk and Delaware and Sioux and Shoshone and Paiute and Washoe and Miwok, along with all the others we met by accident on the way, though when you look back, it seems anything but accidental. Now, this morning, from my porch, I watch the road that runs beside the lagoon and down to the beach. Between the beach and this lagoon, there is a rail line that follows the sand. It's an odd sight. Hundreds of pilings support the track, 
like a centipede walking from town to town along the shoreline. Beyond the sand, the water's edge today is quiet like a lake. Beyond the beach, beyond the rail line, the Pacific Ocean spreads and spreads. When I was a girl, there were no trains anywhere yet out here. When we came through the mountains, there was hardly any trail. Where the train cuts through the Sierra Nevada now, we made that trail. What a long road we have followed. And it has finally brought me here to yet another house where I have become another old woman looking out, looking back. The ocean I see is not what we came searching for. The farthest border of the land was not our goal, but the land itself. I should say his goal, the farthest land my father could envision, where he would somehow be his own man at last and be a new man in some new way and have a hand in starting something fresh and bigger than himself. I am not saying this is how it turned out, but these were his dreams. He was a dreamer, as they all were then, dreaming and scheming, never content, and we were all drawn along in the wagon behind the dreamer, drawn along in the dusty wake. When you were eight years old, of course, you worship your father, as I worshiped mine. We trusted him to get us through these situations no one could have prophesied ahead of time. As long as he was riding beside the wagon on his precious mare, we figured nothing could go too far wrong. That's how tall he was in my eyes then. Seventy years and more go by, and everything looks different. I look at where the dreaming led Papa and led us, and I cannot excuse him as I could when I was eight, or eighteen, or even twenty-eight. Yet neither is it my place to judge him, as others have or judge the way he contended with the trials of that crossing. Some have blamed him entirely, and blame him even now, after all this time, since he was the one who had organized the journey out of Springfield in the first place. Donner, of course, is the name that stuck, the one they have named the lake for, and the route through the mountains, and the monument that stands beside the route, with its brave-eyed family cast in bronze atop a pedestal raised as high as the snow that year was deep. Maybe it has been a blessing in the end, since the name itself causes a shroud to fall around the one who utters it, having become a synonym for disaster, poor planning, and savage behavior that makes the average person shudder and also salivate for the gruesome details of what went on. I have read stories and articles of what happened during that hateful winter until I am sick to death. Newspaper reporters and photographers still come around here to hound and pester me as if the only thing I ever did my entire life was spend five months in the snow. And yet, with all these books and diaries and endless accounts and semi-truths and outright fantasies that have spread around the world, the story of our family has only been partly told, and the story of my father. I have had a hand in that, I admit. Like a good daughter, I have tried through the years to paint him as a hero, even when I knew better. And I do not apologize one bit. Why should I? He did some things almost anyone could call heroic. But now that there's only me and the last few others still alive, there's no harm saying he did other things that gathered enemies to him like an open jar of jam will gather ants and blowflies, and this cannot be denied. You take his wagon, a good example of what I'm talking about. Did he foresee that it would be the biggest contraption on the Western Trail? Did he foresee that his children would be envied and pursued by others hoping for the chance to ride along and test the springs in the fancy seats? Did it occur to him that other men would laugh behind his back, calling it ingenious but also grandiose, while women would resent his wife for traveling as if she were some kind of Arabian princess? If they'd have thought of it, I once heard Papa say in his own defense, they'd all be riding along like this. 
It takes you half a lifetime to figure out what your folks were really up to when you, when you were young. Eventually, you come to know them and what they were capable of. You get to be my age, their very natures lurk within your own, as year by year, more and more of who they were is revealed to you. Some things I never heard my mother say with her living voice, I hear her saying now, her voice alive somewhere within me, her face visible somewhere in my face. I look in the mirror, I say, there's mama, there's papa. Sometimes, very early, before it gets light, I will still see him the way he looked the day we left Illinois. In his face, I will see true pleasure and a boyish gleam that meant his joy of life was running at the full. I see him with his hat tipped back, standing by the wagon he designed himself, the one other travelers would come to call the palace car. Everyone else who started west had been content with horses, mules, ox carts, conestogas, but not James Fraser Reed a double-decker palace car that took four yoke to pull it with upholstered seats inside and a thoroughbred racing mare and hired hands and brandy after dinner. That was Papa's vision of being a pioneer. At least when we started out, it was. I have to say this for him. His vision was not like anyone else's I have ever heard of. Thank you. The thesis simply spoken is if a person uses a chair long enough, it becomes them. None of the people in these chairs are very successful in their lives. This was a shaman's throne. He was not a specialist. He wore a white coat by day. At night, he wore a fur cape hung with rough bells. At times, he painted his face orange and green. He knew spells and prescriptions. He knew what to say to the patients and what to say to the gods. His bedside manner depended largely on the time of day. Words stopped coming with a hush. Something in there broke, and there are no useful tools at hand. Reading is worthless, drinking is worthless, but too enjoyable. Boredom, it seems, is a possible cure. I can smell the flowers now. It's a bad sign. When you squint for over half your life and atomize your world every working day, things develop softened edges on their way to becoming something else. Secrets hide when art takes over, and the leftovers must be hidden a bit more securely each year. Just about any plain box will do.
chair is the seat of the transfiguration. A soft and pink stirring of piecemeal hints of naughty delights. Badly connected bits of delicate information about those mysteries from friends who somehow seem to know. How do they know these things? It is hard, it is hard to think of baseball. To weave the tapestry of a life means little to one with so little thread to his own life. His work was, after all, try after try to escape the orbit of his own disappointments. He could only hope that some great person might put him on a trail that would help him to plagiarize himself. Paris, Istanbul, the Serengeti, it just boils down to this. Photos can all be ordered the exact same size and postal cards are agreeably uniform. It's all in the travel box. Tonight he may elect to step out of his hotel in Rome into the back alleys of Hong Kong to catch that large elusive boyhood trout. How to blow out a candle. Man, A, in basement, wraps on pipes for heat. Deaf stage manager, B, thinks it's time to begin the show. Signals to mouse, C, 
who jumps through the wrong hoop, D. Sees cat by birdhouse, E. And squeaks, bird, F. Thinks it's her husband calling, kicking egg, G. Into mill pond, H. Duck, I. Thinks she's going to become a mother, turns to swim back, creating a breeze, blowing out candle, J. Rube Goldberg Variations. This man was king cause and effect. His was the syndicated victory of logic. Each week he reenacted the heroic essences of high art. Style triumphant over the dull functions. Collaboration triumphant over engineering. Bird cages and cats could be a major source of power. Still, B must follow after A, inevitably ad infinitum. And there are times when I felt like uh, starting things, the time I felt like solving problems, and, and, and those really good days when you felt like finishing something. So I always had several things going in different states. I've always admired people who could start at A and end at Z and know where Z was going to be. It didn't work that way for me. Thank you very much. Be kind to your furniture. A treatise on why you should not be kind. Insofar as kindness has been overvalued throughout the centuries, the following is a proposal to remedy this, to wit. Since kindness no longer produces the effect it once produced, and has become outmoded and insufficient to meet the needs of a fast-moving technological society, consider, if you will, the time it takes to become, the issues it brings up, the feelings it brings up. I mean, just think about it. Kindness takes way too much out of you. First of all, you have to listen to people. Oh, God, what you have to listen to. Worse than that, when you're kind, you lose that flush of superiority that you get when you're not kind. The trouble with being kind is that people might just expect it of you again. And that might lead to needing more than just kindness. They might want you to do something for them. Or maybe they need some money. Or they want to borrow your sweater. Or your boyfriend. Maybe they need a place to sleep, one night, four nights, a month. If you give it to them, they think that you're, they might think that you're easy, and that you have no power, and that you're not important, and that you do it again. So let's get practical, people. It takes just much too much time to be kind. It's easier not to listen to someone or to think about their needs. After all, their needs might just be legitimate. How are you to tell? Just follow the rules. Then you don't have to feel personally responsible for your lack of kindness. It helps if you can show them in print. <laughs> the bathroom is for customers only. I'm very sorry. Oh, um... Those maps are for sale. I'm sorry, you can't read them. What can I do? Uh, you know, uh, it's terrible that your father died, but I can't change the date on the ticket. You can see the rule printed right here. I'm sorry. If you didn't follow the rules, where do you think it might all stop?
Well, that was one beginning. But where are you going to start with a piece like that? Where are you going to go to? It's too passionate, too intense. It's too intense. It's too intense. The other day, I got a letter from a student of mine, a would-be student. She couldn't have been more than 15. She was from New York. I feel like I can still hear her now. She wrote, Dear Tansy, I really want to come and study with you. You know, I, I, I just love dancing. It's just like the, the way for my inner passions to get out. I just, you know, I, it's like the only thing that means anything to me. I thought I, I saw you dance, and I thought I could come and, I thought you could, uh, you could, um, you could, uh, I could what? What could I do? <sighs> oh. I can't sing, I can't sew, I can barely drive a car. I love to cook, but mostly they're experiments. I can't sing, I can't sew, I can't paint, I can't sing, I can't sew, I can't paint, I can't sing, I can't sew, I can't paint. I can't sing, I can't sew, I can't paint, I can't sing, I can't sew, I can't paint, I can't sing, I can't sew, I can't paint, I can't sing, I can't sew, I... Here I am in the middle of a piece again. In the middle of the stage, in the middle of Santa Cruz, in the middle of my life. And I open the door, and I walk in. The room is dark, but I walk in. The room is just like the room I left. The window's in the same place, the couch is in the same place, the door is in the same place. And I open the door, and I walk in. It is dark, and I walk in. It is darker, and I walk in. Wait a minute, let's go back to the beginning. <laughs> Had a lousy start. I mean, it wasn't a terrible start, but could have been a better start. I could have started the piece in a red dress with a woman playing harpsichord. But I didn't. Or I could have started this piece all in black with my hair hanging over. But I didn't. 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 So now what? I'm up here. You're out there. Waiting for me to do something. Sometimes I love these moments where you feel one with the audience, but until I have a good idea, I won't feel so at one. I've got it. Let's imagine that you see the piece. Just pretend. Then it could be anything, you know? <laughs> In fact, shut your eyes. <laughs> oh, you don't believe me. I can see you. You can see me better, but I can see you. Look at, um, I'll put this chair out here. And I promise I won't do anything interesting. <laughs> so then, maybe you really will shut your eyes. You shut your eyes and... You imagine the music. Your choice, of course. What kind? The dancers enter, and they're wearing an unearthly color. They're doing a devilishly tricky phrase, 
and they're leaping and they're turning and they're leaping and they're turning and they're leaping. They're turning and they leap so high you have to put your head back to see them. And you look up and you see the sky and you see the stars. You see the stars and you forget. You forget the day and all its business. You forget the should have beens, the would have beens, the could have beens. You forget what so and so said to you and what you wish he'd said back. You see the stars and you forget. <laughs> oh, wasn't that a lovely journey? I mean, I don't know. We're, we're, I thought it was terrific. Well, I mean, don't, don't you think that you felt something there? Or, I have no idea. What do you think that they felt? That's more important. I mean, how do you think that they felt about that? I, I, I don't even know if they've opened their eyes yet. You want me to tell you my real fantasies? Or one of them? <laughs> <laughs> to be big, blonde, and beautiful with legs up to here. You didn't think I'd really tell you my fantasy, did you? <laughs> or did you? We come to the ending now. My favorite part. I love endings. Endings can very much surprise you. Sometimes endings, you know, you've gone along for a long period of time and then bingo, the ending sums it up perfectly. Or sometimes, it goes along like a Japanese haiku. You think you're going in one direction, and then there's an about face. Well, I love endings so much, I got lucky on this one, and I have two endings. So we're going to flip for the ending. Heads is ending A, and tails is ending B. At the edge of the body's night, ten moons are rising. A scar remembers the wound, and the wound remembers the pain. Once more you are crying. My body lies down, and I hear my own voice lying next to me. The rock is pleasure and it opens and we enter it as we enter ourselves each night. When I talk to the window, I say everything is everything. I have a key, so I open the door and walk in. It is dark and I walk in. It is darker and I walk in.
What is this village, so strangely familiar, where we find ourselves wandering through alleys of night? Not knowing why, we followed the path from the bay through the valley and ascended to find ourselves here with no one in sight. Set high in the walls, bulbs bright as torches lead us on, speckling the cobblestones worn by millennia of feet. The streets are a labyrinth. It seems we have been here before, always trying to find our way, never understanding how we arrived or where we were going, although we knew that this place was our destination from the start. We left the winds behind days ago. The stillness around us is complete. The insect's screech has risen to a continuous shrieking in a dark apartment, always two alleys away. Stones protrude from the walls, irregular, the mortar decaying around them. The wooden shutters are attached by rusty hinges and mottled iron bolts encase the heavy, timbered doors. The houses turn away from us. The buildings will not permit us entrance. They are anonymous passageways through which we wander, thinking, almost remembering, that we have been here before. Sometimes we look up at the lighted rectangles outlined by the closed shutters, hearing laughter from high windows, laughter joyful or taunting or hysterical. We can't determine which. Or we hear a man cursing, repeating over and over, Stupid! Stupid! You hear me? Although it is never clear if he is talking to someone else or to himself. At other times we hear a woman crooning from a dark room, not knowing if she hums a lullaby to a fussy child or is lamenting a child's death, or if she groans for her aloneness and the man who left her, the one who took everything with him, everything she thought she was and could be. And we wonder if this moaning will rise to the insect shriek of madness we hear two streets away. Tomorrow, children will play in these alleys, examining their chalk marks for esoteric signs to direct their bodies' twists and turns as they practice ways to conduct their lives. And their parents, arms around each other, will watch from the windows with a mournful smile, as if they would learn from their children what they could never fathom for themselves when they played these same games in these very alleys. And why, in imagining the children's laughter, do we return to our own childhood and those still unrealized hopes we continue to roll into the future like a ball we once tossed to the edge of a field? What happened to the boy who waited for his manhood on this corner and went away with it when it came never to return, the rest of his days spent navigating endless seas or streets between tall buildings, accompanied only by his shadow? Or the girl who threw open the shutters of her grandmother's room when the old woman died and now lies in the same bed, an old woman herself, murmuring to the darkness she gathers around her like a shawl. The girl, his daughter, woman, wife, or spinster, old woman who may or may not be somebody's grandmother. In the same way, the boy, his son, man, husband, father, old man dying in a solitary room. At times, all of them are cruel and kind, lonely and joyous, proud and ashamed, or, for want of a better word, us. We come to understand this by the time we turn the corner, knowing how many nights we have spent as they have. One cup in the window, single pillow on the bed, lamp, table, chair, our only companions. Our shirts and blouses like deflated bodies waiting to be filled to the brim with breath 
like ships under sail, scudding across a sunlit sea. Or we are those who married into bickering or boredom or worse, and yearn for the freedom and aloneness our neighbors curse. All those possible stories have happened before and will happen again. They have been enacted by others whose feet have worn these cobbles smooth. Others who have come, as we have, not knowing why, and sensed, as we do, that the lives in these houses we could not enter were like their own. And like us, they passed by, wondering about the voices cursing or crooning behind the shutters as they wandered from one midnight alley to another, until eventually they arrived at this place where all the alleys meet beneath these stone stairs. The staircase looms above us. How have we come this close without realizing it was here? so that now we find ourselves below it where it rises like a cresting wave above our heads. We can smell the dampness of the stones, the sour grasses sprouting from the crevices and cracks in each stair. And suddenly we realize what we have always known, that we have journeyed here to find this staircase and confront our shadows, or, most unsettling of all, to confront our possible lack of shadows. Do you see the two wooden doors in the stone wall at the end of the small square above the stairs? Will we find what we've been searching for beyond those doors, where a garden waves its foliage above the wall, as if to entice us, like arms that continually beckon and allure? Listen, do you hear it? The sound of a flute, its music flying hollow toward us through the darkness, accompanied by plucked strings from an ancient instrument. And now, a woman singing from the garden beyond the wall. <laughs> You are human, therefore, do not seek to foretell what tomorrow may bring, nor how long happiness may last. For not even the flutter of a fly's wings is as fast as the changing of fortune. And almost immediately we understand that this is a staircase not meant to be climbed. The small square it leads to is an open-air stage on which all manner of rituals are performed, sacrifices and celebrations conducted by priests and populace alike. Here kings are crowned and killed, baptisms and funerals enacted. Here hearts are torn from chests, and miracles of healing bring the dead to life once more. Here gods, as babes, are held high for the populace to see, and later, as adults, hammered to wooden crosses on a hill for crowds like us to mourn or cheer. Here we rediscover once again that we must choose from one day to the next whether to murder Caesar or to crown him, whether to betray friend or stranger or to honor them. We have journeyed here to be reminded of these things. Now we understand once more that we are pilgrims and that if our lives are a continual pilgrimage, Part of our travels is to be reminded at appointed times that not every thousand years, not every month or week, but every day in small as well as heroic ways, 
We repeat decisions others have made before, and those who come after us will have to make again. And that such recurrences are the fate of the human race. Periodically, then, at least in our heads, we must journey to a place like this and return to our homelands acutely aware of our burden of perpetual choice, leaving the garden above the stairs behind in the knowledge that it is always beyond our grasp, a place of permanent peacefulness that we may yearn for, but is not our lot to attain. It is time to go. Let us make our way back through the alleys, past the silent buildings, and by daybreak descend through the valley below to where the ships are waiting in the bay. There we will take our leave of one another as solemnly as this occasion demands and make a memory of this night in the dead of winter at the end of the year. Soon after we leave this place, a woman will enter and climb midway up these stairs. Like us, she will be passing through. She is looking for her daughter. She will find her on a day filled with sunlight. It will be spring.